We've got a really great session planned today. Um, we're joined by Anna Gordon from crowdfunder.co.uk um, and I'm Kay from the OFN team and we're also joined by Louise from the OFN team and we're each going to do a little mini slide presentation um, with some of our top tips on how to crowdfund with confidence and then we've got plenty of time at the end for a really nice um, Q&A where we can answer your, your own personal questions um, for your own um, food enterprise if there's anything you know if that you want to know in your own kind of bespoke circumstance then hopefully we can we can help out and yeah so we've got quite a lot to get through today so we're going to get started and and i hope it's okay for you to go first yeah absolutely cool, right, let me share my screen hello everybody um So yeah, hi, I'm Anna from Crowdfunder um, and I help um, coach lots of different types of crowdfunding projects, um, community projects, businesses, um, like creative projects at the moment. Um, and I've been working here for about two years. So I've sort of seen about, yeah, thousands probably of projects over my time. Um, so I thought I'd share my sort of five top tips um, from my experience. Um, so firstly, it's really important to sort of take your time and choose um, the, the right crowdfunding target for you. As a coach, we always sort of say that you should go for the minimum that you need to get your project funded rather than, you know, aiming too high and, and being sort of unsuccessful because, um, you know, it's sort of quite a silly thing to say, but if you have a, a smaller target, you'll reach it more easily. Thus, your project would look more successful quicker. So, um, yeah, take your time choosing your crowdfunding target um, and think about all the, the, the costs that might go into crowdfunding as well. Um, as like when you're when you're thinking about that, we've got lots of advice on that um, on crowdfunder to help you choose that. Um, the second top tip is collaboration. Now, it's really great to have a team um, when you're crowdfunding. And if you don't have a sort of formal team with your um, food hub, then, then try and sort of build a bit of a team for your crowdfunder um, and constantly ask people for feedback um, throughout the whole experience. And if, you know, if someone pledges, that's great. Um, if someone doesn't pledge, it's great to know the reason why they're not pledging. You know, is it because your story's not clear enough? Is it because your your rewards are too expensive? Um, and it's good to get that feedback early on. Thirdly, um, I would say the most common mistake I see with crowdfunding is that people sort of just desperate to get it live on the crowdfunder website or, um, and to sort of launch it. But actually, lots of the hard work should go in before you launch on the crowdfund um, website. And when you launch it, you're just following the plan that you've already you've already sort of mapped out, basically. So whilst it's really um, hard work when you when you launch and when you're live and crowdfunding, you should have put lots of preparation in beforehand so that you've given yourself time when you're actually live and crowdfunding to basically shout it from the rooftops to implement the plan um, rather than trying to sort of pull together lots of bits and pieces um, throughout the throughout that period. Um, number four is to to really really understand why someone would pledge on your crowdfunder. There's sort of two reasons why people would support your crowdfunder. And firstly, it's because they really believe in the idea. They want to see it happen. Um, but the second is that they want um, one of the rewards that you have on offer. So when you're creating your crowdfunder project, think about that why. And when you're reaching out to different types of audiences, just really, um, yeah, think about it make sure it's really clear on your page. Um, and if you don't know the why, then that's a really good opportunity for you to go and speak to them and do a bit of research and understand, you know, why they are gonna be pledging. 
And finally, um, definitely just keep referring back to any guidance um, on on our website, there is loads and loads of um, resources for people crowdfunding. And there's quite a lot of information to take in. So I would say just keep referring back to it because you'll you'll definitely, um, you know, learn something new partway through your campaign and you might get an idea to do something, repeat something again. Um, so yeah, keep referring back to that. So they're my main tips. And then I wanted to just share a couple of um, tips from a few successful crowdfunders um, over the last of year or so. Um, Aoife says to plan. Um, I've already sort of drilled that into you, but yeah, planning is the most um, important thing with any kind of crowdfunder. Um, Liz says connect and communicate. But I really, really like Karen's quote about there not being one magic ingredient. And I think that's so right. I think people think, you know, there's just one thing and then it will be a success. There's, it's just lots and lots of things that work together to, to make um, your crowdfunding campaign successful. Um, and you need to, yeah, work as a team together on all of those things, um, you know, be it your personal contacts, the fact that your story is really clear on your page, you've got nice rewards, um, you use sort of the power of social media, you connect with people in your community. So lots of different things that work together. And then a nice piece of advice as well is to, to believe in yourself. Um, that's, that's obviously really important. Um, that's not my dog, by the way. I just thought it was quite cute. <laughs> um, and in terms of advice, I'm here to, to sort of help. So if you want feedback on your, your project, if you get stuck along the way, then like just please just ping me an email and I can, um, I can help you. Um, so I don't know how long that was, but that's a few minutes of me chatting about my top tips. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you so much, Anna. And also thank you so much for sharing your details. Um, really appreciate it. And yeah, picking up on your top tip of planning, 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 planning. Um, Louise is going to also share some slides exactly on that topic. So nice. you, over to you, Louise. Yeah, so thank you, Anna. Your tips, like I was just listening to them, was really, really inspired, like, I don't know, crazily so. But anyway, I just wanted to have a bit of background to where my tips come from, because obviously I'm not a crowdfunding coach. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are from listening to Anna's first session, another crowdfunding session I went with, um, which Anna hosted, um, listening to the I'll get three guest hubs that we had a couple of weeks back. So that was Dora from Lockerbore, Iona from Sidwell Street Bakery and um, Cathy from New Pantry Glass. And then also a bit of reading I've done. So I might whiz through some of these um, slides. Uh, if we've already covered them, but they're just some ideas that have popped into my head while we've, all this has been going on. So um, something that um, all three of our guest hubs, food enterprises on the IFM platform who crowdfunded recently or fairly recently said um, was that their campaign, they needed something tangible to campaign for. Um, and that was the reason why they actually went for a crowdfunding campaign rather than a bank loan or something else um, at that particular in time, point in time. Um, so by tangible sort of something that the customer could relate to what they were going to spend the money on, whether it was renovating um, some kind of equipment, land or premises, that type of thing. And um, that really helped them tell the story to their potential backers and how the campaign, if they backed their campaign, it was going to benefit their community and their food hub. Um, so that was something. Um, another thing was, uh, this is sort of like the timeline, of these are pieces of information I've gathered along the way from various places. Um, so if someone has decided to crowdfund, um, then what came up from um, you Pantry Glass, Cathy, um, she said, I prefer nothing, um, that she really wished she got in contact with crowdfunder from the beginning or at that point when they decided this is what we're going to do. 
um, they got in contact much further on down the line and um, retrospectively thought they would have got more out of it if they'd um, approached quicker. Um, and then planning, 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 I guess. Um, and there's lots of things you need to think about when you're in this planning stage way before you launch, as Anna said. So budget, rewards, marketing, and then kind of the final part of that is constructing your crowdfunding page. Um, I've picked up from various sources that the optimal length of a campaign is four weeks. Um, but a nice tip I also heard was that maybe make it four weeks, three days or four, four weeks in a few days, because that way you can um, span more than one payday, which is always good. Um, and then when you come to spreading the word, um, maybe once your campaign is launched um, and you need to prepare all these um, well, you need to spread the word before it launches to get people on side, but then once it has launched, you spread the word um, in a sequential order. So those closest to you first and then moving further away from you. And this is so that you can get donations in the pot. So when people you know less well approach your page, they can see other people have backed you and then um, they think, oh, this must be good. Someone else has backed. So that will encourage me to put money to kind of like the would you go in an empty restaurant situation, which perhaps with COVID, yes, you would go in an empty restaurant, but in normal circumstances, you wouldn't. Um, and something that came up um, from Anna um, a while back in our first um, webinar was that it approached influencers. So these are maybe respected members of your local community, or they might be part of your food movement um, not local to you but just part of your food movement um respected so if they backed you and um it, it would really encourage other people to think well they've they know what they're doing and um i want to i want to be part of that too so get them to donate early on if possible and then when you move further away um to people you know less well don't forget that if you're part of the OFM platform, it's um, a good it, well, it's potential to approach other food hubs. They might not be local to you at all, and um, they might not have the capacity to financially back you, but they might be more than willing to share a social media post that you've got. And um, that just spreads the word a bit further, and it's all good for you. Budgeting, again, Anna um, mentioned this, that really need to think about all of your costs, um, including hidden ones. So if you want to, your crowdfunding for a particular region, like what the project is, so renovation, a van, whatever, you want to take that cost into account. And then the cost of any rewards that you're going to offer um, to customers who back you, because obviously most of these won't be free, so they do come with some associated cost. And then there's more hidden things like overhead. So if you're going to do a, a crowdfunding campaign, you're probably going to spend like four, five, six months maybe planning. And in that time, you may be not going to um, be able to do all the work you normally did for your food hub, or you might need to employ someone else, or uh, you might need to take a bigger salary for yourself. And even if you run on volunteers, you might need to give extra volunteers, extra benefits, maybe it's a free veg box, maybe it's a discount. There's some kind of, maybe some hidden costs there, just take it into account. And same with marketing, even if you don't go for paid marketing, even if it's the cost of pens to write those big signs on your shop front to say, look, we're crowdfunding. Um, just re remember all those little things, they do add up. And then Anna um, mentioned this on the first webinar, the, the, the fees for your crowdfunding. So um, she says set aside 6%, which covers platform fees and card fees. And that will give you like a grand total. And again, um, this has really been covered. And I can't emphasize enough. Like you want to keep the target for your crowdfunding campaign realistic um, and set it as low as possible to just to cover what you need to do to get your project off the ground. But this might be, to actually do the project, it might be more than what you think you can get through crowdfunding. And that's certainly what Sidwell Street Bakery and um, 
uh, Lock of War and uh, New Pantry Glass Found. And so they, what they did was they did crowdfunding alongside other um, invest, trying to get other forms of revenue. So grants. Um, I know that crowdfunder has the platform has an extra funding thing where you can apply for grants from other people. And then um, a couple of our hubs found that asking those closest to them for loans um, that was a really good way of adding to their target. But remember that crowdfunding campaign isn't really a well, it is about raising money but it's partly about raising awareness and increasing your customer base for when you have got your more equipment bigger scope for your hub um it means that you've got the customers as well um another thing that came up was um all or nothing campaigns are more um successful in general um again i think anna's probably covered this about rewards um so thinking of a range of price points um, make it representative of your food hub there's probably not a lot great deal of point of putting a reward up for free tickets to a football match for a food hub if you're crowdfunding for a food hub um, you probably want to think about something that's more related to the people who invest in your campaign um, some nice ideas came up from our guest hub speakers the other week um, so personalised items, so um, Sidwell Street Bakery offered a loaf of gratitude, which was loaves of bread with initials mark, um, engraved on them. Um, both uh, Lock of Ore and Sidwell Street offered um, tote bags, which then served as marketing for the future. Um, they both also suggested um, subscriptions, so small things that would get people to come to the shop or the hub each week. Um, and then it went to collect their order. But once they're doing that, they might actually buy more. Uh, so that's a nice thing. And classes could be really popular. And if you record a session like a class online, you can then dish that out to lots and lots of people um, if they buy that reward without any extra costs. It's sort of one hit, one cost to do the recording and that's it. Um, Doro, um, Lockable said that she really found that when she was thinking about rewards, it, she was thinking they want she wanted her rewards to be cool because she was thinking, well, would I invest in it? Would I buy it? Is it good value for money? Um, Sidwell Street Bakery suggested, well, they found that double giving kind of rewards were really good. So they had a reward of um, a bread subscription where the person who was donating it. Um, uh, donating money towards that reward they donated money towards Sidwell Street campaign but they also donated the bread to someone else so a family in need or a friend or something like that and that was a really nice thing and um, uh, all three hubs found that large donors they didn't actually want anything back for their donations they just wanted to give money because um, I think that's what Anna covered in the beginning of this session that um, there's two reasons why people will back your campaign. One is to get the reward and the other is to because they really believe in what you want to do. And those type of people might want to invest quite heavily, but they don't actually want anything back. Um, and then another thing is to stagger your release dates during your campaign so that um, you have in the middle of a campaign, you might people might lose interest. And then if, but if you keep shouting, uh, oh, we got a new reward that's come out today, then that uh, generates more interest or can do. And then um, my final tips are like steal with pride. So like have a look what other people have done. And if it's gone well, have a look and think, well, could I do similar? And then again, don't rush the planning. And equally, um, just because you're going for a crowdfunding campaign rather than a bank loan, which goes under undergoes thorough scrutiny doesn't mean you should take shortcuts in your business plan you really need to be solid um, and then plan for every outcome think about what you're going to do before you launch if you succeed and what you're going to do if you don't succeed because um, it's really good to think about that in advance um, and don't expect miracles again um, and someone said to Anna that one of her feedbacks was that um, it's not down to just one thing, it's down to lots and lots of things. 
and you can learn from your mistakes like everything in life so take notes of how you can improve listen to feedback so if you do decide to have a go in the future if your first complaint isn't doesn't go well you've got experience and um, you can learn from that so I'm going to hand over to Kay now who will go on to some marketing tips awesome thank you Louise that was great um okay, so I'm going to carry on the conversation with some marketing tips and the reason I'm talking about these is more from my kind of um, area of specialty as a marketer, but then also I have had experience um, supporting some crowdfunders with their marketing. Um, uh, Sims Hill um, in Bristol, our community supported agriculture project, and I helped them with some of their social media. So I've got some kind of idea from, from doing it, but then also a lot of these tips that I'm going to give are also general marketing tips that are useful for your food enterprise, whether you're crowdfunding or not. So just um oops wrong one sorry present okay can everyone see my slides okay i'm gonna assume yes if there are any problems let me know yes cool. okay, thank you so so the first thing I want to talk about is this is all kind of in the realm of preparing for your crowdfunder, and that's to make sure that you have the creative assets that you need to support your crowdfunder. So Anna mentioned before, well, I, I think it was in your slides, Anna, where one of the um, one of the quotes from people that have crowdfunded before mentioned doing a slick video. So that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Um, so really do the best campaign video that you possibly can with the resources at your disposal. And it's worth asking within your community or your network or your family, if there's anyone you know that is particularly good at taking videos or has video editing skills or anything like this, because it's worth that extra bit of effort to get the campaign video right. So I often say done is better than perfect when it comes to marketing, um, but for the campaign video, it's really worth doing the best possible job that you can. So here's just a couple of tips around this because this is a very important part of your of your crowdfunder, um, and that's to make sure that you cover everything a funder would want to know in your video. Um, that means cover things like all of the basics, so who you are, um, your enterprise story. So um, also in your you know what are you what what is the crowdfunder for? What are you fundraising for? So just give as many details as you can. Um, and think from the perspective of a fund, from a, of a funder of what they would want to know um, for to 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 support you. Also, be yourself. Um, make sure you know what you want to say in your video and practice if you can. Um, if you need to, write a script and just read it and read it and just um, practice until the words flow really clearly. Um, make sure to include a clear ask in your campaign video. So. Um, don't just talk about your story, but at the end of the video, make sure that you clearly ask people um, to support your crowdfunder. Um, try and keep it as short as you can, um, but with all the necessary information as well. Um, a kind of a rule of thumb for this is under five minutes, but in terms of kind of um, research that's been done on how social media videos are, are shared and uh, it, generally you want to not really create anything longer than three minutes so if you can condense everything into three minutes that's that's really it's a really great thing to do um but definitely try and keep it under five minutes if you can and as i said before go for the best quality that you can possibly get um, but then also with all of these um items on the list don't let any of these stop you from doing a crowdfunder if that's what you want to do for your food enterprise um and it's better than perfect it's just try and with these, with these um, tips in mind, try and do the best job that you can. Um, the other tip is to make sure you write as compelling content as you can. Remember that writing is a lot more casual online. Um, this, uh, this is across the board. It's not only for your crowdfunder page, but also with the social media posts that are supporting your crowdfunder. Um, try and make your first sentences really count or your first intro paragraph count on your crowdfunding page. For social media posts, make your first sentences really strong. 
um, use a headline analyzer if, if that helps. I can share a link in um, after the session to a really good one that will help you create really, really great first sentences. And that's because on social media, you use, sometimes people can only see the first sentence, they have to click to read more. So you really want that first sentence to count and to pull people into reading your content. Um, prioritize readability and make sure you're writing for you understanding. Um, and what I mean by this is if you can use bullet point lists and really short paragraphs, so don't write long paragraphs, like break up paragraphs into really short bite-sized chunks, and it just helps people to kind of read what you're saying. Um, and be as clear and concise as you can. And again, um, same thing as in your video, always include a really clear and easy to follow call to action. So I've included some links here to help you and we're gonna share the slides as well after the session. Um, so there'll be lots of things in here that you can follow up on for more information, including this video, um, which comes on to my next point, And that is create, before you start your campaign, take really good images, find really good images and create social media posts in advance. Um, here's a really good, here, here's a webinar that goes through this process step-by-step step of how to create great images for your social media um, using free tools. So this will also have a link out to the session. So if you wanna go down this route and, and learn to create personalized images and graphics for your crowdfunding campaign and your social media posts support, to support it, um, then you can watch this video and oh i'm not going to click that now um so here's some free creative tools you can use to help you so there's canva and that video also shows you how to set up a canva account how to create your first post on canva and here are two uh, websites where you can get really good free images to use as well and Okay, here's some tips around social media to support your crowdfunding campaign. So my top tips are that teamwork really makes the dream work. Make sure to share responsibilities um, for social media posting. It's a lot to do all by yourself. Um, if it's just one person that's doing all of the social media for a crowdfunding campaign, uh, it could feel quite overwhelming because you really want to be sharing consistently, you really want to be posting consistently and you want to be posting quite a lot. Um, so share responsibility with your team for collecting and creating content um, and also for scheduling and posting, which I'll go into in a bit more detail in a second. And I've got some resources to share to help you with both of these points. Um, make sure that um, everyone likes and shares the posts that you're posting on social media about your crowdfunding campaign. The more likes and shares that your posts get, the better algorithm um, results you will get for your posts, which means that more people who are following your page will get to actually see the post that you're posting. So it's really important to kind of agree as a team to have this collective responsibility to like and share the post about the crowdfunder. Um, and also then that acts as outreach as well to their own kind of family and friends who are likely to be within the pool of people who are likely to support your crowdfunder. So it's just really utilizing your, your team as your best advocates for your crowdfunder and also for your food enterprise. So here's a kind of a bit of a rule of thumb for the amount that you would like, want to be posting for, for your crowdfunder. And at first glance, it might look like a lot, but there are tools that can help you with this. Um, so with Instagram, you want to be doing two to three feed posts per week. And with Facebook, um, there's a really, there's a, there's, a, there's a Facebook rule that I use called the 421 rule. And that's that you do four shared posts, two original content posts and one ask post per week, but you can double that if you want to post more in a week. It's um, a way to post that's the most effective way with to get results with the algorithm and to actually get more people to see your posts. Um, so essentially at least seven posts a week on Facebook. But again, if you've got capacity, you can double that and post twice a day. Um, and Twitter, you really want to be posting 15 times per day to get good results on Twitter. So as you can see, this is quite a lot of social media activity. So again, it's good to share this responsibility throughout the team and also to use as many tools as you can to help you with this. And also to create a bank of content before you even launch the campaign that you can use. Also, don't be afraid to repeat content as well. It doesn't have to be um, 
original content every time, look at what posts that you posted throughout your crowdfunder to see what's done well and repost. Um, most of the time only on Facebook, for example, only 5% of your followers will actually see a post because of the algorithm. Um, so it's okay to repost content. Don't if it if it's if it's too much to post original content all the time, and then also just missed the last point uh, on between Instagram and Facebook. Try to post three stories per day, and so stories are the twenty four hour like videos that you can post on Instagram, and you can set up your Instagram and Facebook to um, be able to post stories across both. Um, again, I'll share a really handy how-to for all of these things after the session. So you're going to have a pile of marketing how-tos after this, I'm afraid. I hope you don't mind. Um, and with stories, it really is the case that it, done is better than perfect. Just try and get, if you can, if it's, if it, get as many people in the team to ha log in to Instagram and, and post stories. But this is, again, content that you can collect um, before you start the campaign. Um, also, some of the tools that I was talking about to help you um, to do this amount of posting are scheduling tools. And here's a webinar that I ran before, which covers different scheduling tools to help you, um, to post particularly to Facebook and Instagram. A really good tool for Twitter is Buffer. So make sure to use these tools to help you. If you have any questions about any of these, just um, yeah, post them in the either in the event page on our Facebook group and I can help you. But also there'll be a link to this um, webinar which walks you through how to use these tools. So I keep clicking on the actual page when I don't want to go there. I want to keep doing the slides. So there. And I've done it again. <laughs> if that video starts playing, then sorry. Um, okay. Cool. <laughs> Next slide, finally. Sorry, everybody. Um, I took it back there. Okay, cool. And my next uh, social media tip is to make sure you engage with the community. And I realize I'm overrunning with time. I feel like there's just so much marketing content to share and I'm sharing a bit too much. So this picks up on Louisa's point of make sure to really engage with, with your community and this counts with your community on social media as well. I respond to, the best way to do this is respond to everything. If anyone likes your post, make sure you thank them or Right. If someone writes a comment, respond to the comment um, and also schedule time for engagement activities on each of the platforms. So on Facebook um, and Instagram and Twitter, it's particularly important on Instagram. So that could be if people like your post on Instagram, um, go to their accounts and like some of their posts. And it's just this kind of back and forth engagement activity, which will help you get better results from the posts that you're actually posting on social media. Um, OK, so my next set of tips is about email marketing. And this is, so it's good to plan an email marketing campaign around your crowdfunder campaign. And what I mean by an email marketing campaign, it's not just putting a little note in your weekly or monthly newsletter, it's actually sending a specific email for your crowdfunder. Uh, make sure to keep this email short, clear and short and make sure you only have one call to action. And that call to action is for people to get involved with your crowdfunding campaign. So rather than it just being like a little side note in your newsletter, make sure you're sending something specifically about your crowdfunding campaign. So it's really clear for your for people who have engaged with you um, by email, who are on your email list, how to support you and to support your campaign. So this is a general outline of an effective email marketing campaign that you could do to support your crowdfunder. And it's a really simple structure. It looks a lot more complicated than it is. Um, but if you're using a platform like MailChimp, you can send out your first email um, and then you can find out who has opened or hasn't opened that email and respond accordingly. In the slide before, I've put a link that will show you exactly how to do this, but it's a really effective way to keep up the momentum via email as well uh, for your crowdfunder. So for anyone, for example, for anyone that's opened email one, you can then send them email two um, maybe a week later where you're thanking anyone who has already funded your campaign, but then also making an ask again for anyone that hasn't funded yet. And this might feel like a lot, 
um, but it actually works. Um, and I've got lots of experience of, of using exactly this type of structure of campaign for fundraising campaigns. Um, and then after email two, again, for anyone that's opened it, you can send a final email, which is like a last call for support. Um, always in each of the resends, make sure that you're thanking those who've already funded your campaign and inviting those that haven't to engage with their campaign and, and fund you. And then if on MailChimp, you can see who hasn't opened your email. So if anyone that hasn't opened your email, you can then just simply resend email one with a different subject line. And then if they open it, then you they flow back. So it's like a flow diagram, but I'll leave this, um, again, this is in the slides for, for reference. Um, but this is a tried and tested way of, yeah, of, of doing a very simple and basic email marketing campaign to support fundraising activities. So my final tip is around in person, um, things that you can do in person or in a store, if you have a store or also in point of sale. So for example, it could be things like flyers in your um, veg boxes or yeah, or notes, handwritten notes in your orders. Um, you could do like a QR code sticker, which could have a QR code, which takes people directly to your crowdfunder page. Um, also, you could think about event ideas, um, my partner did a crowdfunder for Street Goat and they kind of did a lot of their campaigning around um, hosting an event with a, a, a goat curry in a local pub. Obviously with COVID, pretty tricky to do that, but it could be something after COVID to think about different ways that you can bring people together and get people really excited about what you're doing. Um, and also the thing that Louise brought up about social proof is really effective here. And this is picking up on something that Kathy from the Pantry Glass did which was to have a blackboard behind the till register in their shop when they wrote the names of everybody who'd donated to the crowdfunder. And that's a really nice way of saying a thank you to the people that have supported you, as well as also saying like, look, all of these people are supporting us, you should too. Um, and the last slide, the last thing is around outreach. I've also included a template here for a template press release, um, which you can look at later. This might help you to write a press release to contact relevant media. And then also remembering word of mouth. So outreach can be as simple as talking to everybody about the crowdfunder, just um, talking to your customers, talking to your friends and family, um, asking them to spread the word. People actually love to help. So if you're asking people, please, can you help spread the word around this crowdfunding, you'd be surprised at how many people are really delighted to help you out and spread the word. Um, and it's also the same with partnerships. If there are any organizations in your community or local, other local companies um, that, are, that, you, that you have a connection with, you could ask them to also talk about your crowdfunder as well. I realize I'm the one that's overrun slightly everybody and I'm sorry about that. It was probably just like clicking through to all of my links rather than to the next slide. Uh, so apologies for that. So now we do have a good amount of time for Q and A, but not quite as long as I planned. Um, we have 20 minutes. So does anyone have any questions? It's not a question, but I'd just like to say thank you because it's very comprehensive. Um, I'm part of a, an organization. We haven't actually done anything yet. We're at the initial stages, but I have done a crowdfunding campaign and, and a, a lot, all of what you said rang true because you know it brought it back to me. Um, by the way, when I know I've my um, thing on here says the egg factory, but it's nothing to do with food. It's nothing to do with eggs, but it was. It's a co-working space, and we did the crowdfunding for that um, about six years ago. Um, but thank you very much. It was very comprehensive, and it's great to know that you've got all those all that stuff on you know, that we can access and go back to when we get to the stage when we actually start to do the um, fundraising. That's great. Thank you so much for the feedback. Um, and yeah, if uh, that all of the, the slides and all of the extra bits um, to support you will, will be put into the event pages on Facebook so you can access them there. And also if you're part of the Thriving Food Hubs Facebook group, um, they'll all be in there as well. Um, great. 
And there's also two other webinars before this as well, covering crowdfunding. So it's a pretty comprehensive set of, uh, yeah. set, set of sessions. So thanks for your feedback. I'd like to tell you about um, an, a loan and grant fund that could go with it, the local form of that, and there's some discretion as well, which is called LEAP. Um, I'll put it in the chat. So it comes from um, the Real Farming Trust um, that I work for. You, can, you can't apply for it if you're limit, a company limited by shares or if they do. Um, and the amount's between 25 and 100,000, and you get a grant to go with it for 18% of it. Um, and you get a package of business support to go with it. Um, I'll put the fly in there if you need some information about that. You can see that to go, but it worked well for local for some discretion as well. Awesome. Thank you, Jade. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I've just noted, um, I've just noticed we've had a message in the chat. Um, I'm gonna read it out. Hi, you mentioned that maybe only maximum five percent may see Facebook posts. Who will see these posts? It seems to be the same people liking posts every week. Is that a way to see the posts each week? Okay, so this is due to the Facebook algorithm. And not to make it too complicated, but essentially it's something that Facebook does to make sure that people only see posts that are relevant to them or that Facebook deems as being relevant to them or of interest to them. So it means that when you post something on Facebook, not everybody will see automatically that not everyone that follows you will automatically see what you've posted, but only the small proportion that Facebook has deemed would find your post interesting. So essentially you want to do actions um, on Facebook that help you rank better with the algorithm, which means that more of your followers will end up seeing your posts. So this is why you probably see the same people liking your posts whenever you post. It's because they've engaged with you before, which means Facebook then assumes all oh, those people will be interested in your next post. So then it shows them your next post and they're more likely to like it again. Um, that means there's probably a large proportion of your followers that tend not to see your post in their newsfeed. So I go into this in a lot more detail in um, another webinar that I did that I'll, I'll also share in the event page on Facebook as well for more details. Um, but so it just means that if a really quick way to get better algorithm reach on Facebook is to do more shared posts. And that means sharing other um, pages or relevant information or posts with relevant information on other places in Facebook. And then Facebook kind of recognizes your page as being, you know, part of the community and taking community action. And by that, I mean the Facebook community. So it's like the more engaged you are on Facebook as a Facebook page, um, the Facebook kind of rewards that by giving you better reach. So the 421 rule that I mentioned, um, breaks that down in a way of getting better results with the algorithm um, by posting four share posts a week. Um, I'm gonna share a link to a blog that I wrote that goes into that in more detail and gives you kind of like a structured step-by-step -step that could help you with that. And then you might find that when you're doing that, you're reaching new people, not new people to your page, but like other followers that you don't normally reach with your posts, which will hopefully help with your engagement. And I've seen lots of really good results with exactly this, um, uh, uh scheduling um system so i'm just going to get that post now but in the meantime does anyone else have it uh, thank you so much jade for sharing um the information um uh, about the funding it's in the chat so and that's also something we'll share on the event pages so that it, you can access it easily after the session does anyone else have any questions or anything they want to share um or even hi lucy hi so um, going on your point about sharing other people's content, that's something I really, really struggle to do because um, my other work involves me, um, is it my work or is it my life, involves me having really strong um, guidance on what is right, what is greenwashing, what is etc. And if I'm sharing other people's content, then I'm actually going against my core principles. Any suggestions on how I can go around that? I can, if I went and, and searched, what? I would struggle to find anyone sharing the same content or what? with the same thing as, as me. Okay, that makes total sense. And I really empathize with you on that one. Um, 
I've got some advice on, on how I've gone about that with working for different companies that have different kind of posting regulations and things like this. And um, the best thing that I've found is to actually just really set aside some time to try and find organizations or people that are speaking about the same things that you are in the same way. And it's as simple as creating a, what I do is I create a bookmark and then I put um, Facebook shares. And then if it's like for a different client, I, I would put like their name, for example, so that I know that all of the, all of the pages that I've saved in that bookmark are all exactly relevant to that client. So in your case, what I would do is seek out other organizations that are um, speaking on the same things that you are in the same way. Um, so for example, um, like organizations that you know don't greenwash, like I can think of ones related to food and farming, like for example, the Landworkers Alliance and um, La Via Campesina or other, it depends on, again, totally where you're coming from and what your point of view is on, on these things. So my advice really is to find those organizations, um, find those people and save them in a bookmark list that you can actually go there and find and, and go straight to relevant content. Um, it's, it's challenging um, to do that and to, and if you, yeah, to, to find share content to share. Um, it's worth doing to then mean that when you create your own post, more people are hearing your message more people can see your message so is there is there any way around that because i know that i know i'm not going to find people who are i can actually say this is the same message as what what i'm talking about on this side because it all links even as we grow the food hub it's going to link and i have to be really careful that i don't confuse the message that i am presenting in any work I do so how much would it affect all of this reach if I am not sharing other people's content it does affect it um or it's not that it affects it it just means that you probably won't reach as many people um and I guess that um kind of weaves in a bit with Tina's other question which was if I go to someone's Facebook timeline am I able to see all their if people are looking for you and they go to your page, they'll always be able to see everything that you've posted. Um, so it depends on your relationship with your customers. If you if you have a really strong message, then your customers will probably want to engage with you and your pair or your page. So if you have customers that are like-minded and you think that your it's so important that your message is that strong and distinct, then I, perhaps your customers will come to your page and then see your content. But yeah it's it will have an effect you won't reach as many people but you will still reach people and if people go to your page they can see everything you've posted um yeah sorry that's not probably not the answer that, that you wanted um i would think also if and or if you're a food hub um, which i think you mentioned that you were then um or that you wanted to set up a food hub, then a really easy go to on this would be your producers. Go to your producers pages. Um, yeah, even if it's their per like personal pages, if you if they post about their produce, you could ask them to make that post public and then share that on your page. So then you're sharing your producers and you're putting more faces behind the people that are producing the food that your customers are, um, are, are buying. So that's, that's the excellent suggestion. That's the bit that will work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that's the simple ones. Just yeah. take a while to waffle to get there. Um, and I hope that answered your question as well, Tina, um, about that if people go to your page, yes, they will see everything you've posted. It just means that on people's own personal news, news feed where people scroll um, to see that their community's posts, um, Facebook decides what shows up there. Well, Facebook isn't this algorithm. is not someone at Facebook personally deciding. It's like a very clever system but yeah um any any other questions or would anyone like to share where they are with their thinking around crowdfunding or if you're planning on doing a, a crowdfunder or yeah has anyone else got anything they'd like to share into the space Um, the egg factory. I'm. I'm sorry. I, I didn't catch your name. Um, 
it'd be interesting just to hear about what your planning your plans are um oh right um my name's sue sorry i shouldn't i always sorry. i always forget that and you know i should log on as myself not as the egg factory um we're, i'm part of a group called the called a veg collective um and at the moment we're just still in discussion mode about how we can encourage more growing of vegetables in this hilly Pennine district. Um, so we're actually miles away from being part of the Open Food Network, really. But we are, we're all, all of us involved in one way or another or have been involved in food production. One of our, one of our group is works at the local organic shop. Um, another person is part of Pennine Cropshire, which has been going for a long time. You might have heard of them, which is a veg bag uh, scheme and was part of Burnley Food Links. So we're all, you know, we've got fingers in different pies. It's awful, isn't it, how you keep using food puns when you're talking about food. Um, so, yeah, I... I I can't, I can't, you know, as I say, we're still discussing, you know, we've got various very small bits of land that we're dabbling in at the moment, but I think we're coming towards realizing that we need to, we need to find a piece of land and raise the money to employ somebody to grow vegetables on it. And we're looking for it to be on an existing farm because we want, for instance, to um, we have got some friends who make cheese. They've got an organic farm and they make cheese. And we are going to ask them, I think, if they can give us the corner of a field because we're very keen on the idea of pulling all the production together. Especially as this is not this area is not traditionally a veg growing area, and lots lots of but lots of obstacles to overcome because lots of farmers, most farmers around here would laugh in your face if you said they wanted to grow vegetables, but people are starting to do it. People are doing it successfully on a very small scale. So that, that probably sounds hopelessly confusing, but I can't, I can't really be any clearer than that. I think uh, that's really, really interesting. And it also highlights like, um, before you start with any campaign, you really need to narrow down what your objective is. And um, yeah, it, it just it, it's really nice to see the process right back at the right roots of the beginning. So yeah, and good luck with it. It, it sounds like you've got good plans. Um, in terms of OFN, I don't know whether you've heard of, um, well, they're not, they're, one of them's on OFN, but you might like to look at the project um, Farms for City Children. I know maybe your plan isn't directly encouraging children to grow vegetables, but um, uh, I mean, and that's a project that's not just involved growing vegetables, it's more rounded than that, but it might give you some um, idea about uh, encouraging and promoting um, that kind of uh Activity. Yeah, it's just what I'm trying to say. Not very good way of saying it. But anyway, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Jade? Yeah, I could tell you about a crowdfund we've just done. Um, I'm sort of owner director of an organic brewery with a cafe. And of course, we're in deep water because of COVID. So we did a crowdfund to um, what we needed to do was pay the bills until we could reopen. Um, and it was very successful. We raised about £110,000 quite quickly. Um, and the thing I wanted to kind of tell you about is that we were basically selling, forward selling things. It, it, for us, it worked like a, a loan, really, but without any interest. So people have pre-bought their beer and meals and party space. We could book party space for later in the year and so on. Um, so the rewards were actually quite good <laughs> people did give gifts but yeah just to say you can use it like that to sell things in advance if you want to raise a loan great thanks jade and congratulations that's uh, sounds like a super successful campaign really pleased to hear it did so well 
Um, I just want to say I've put a couple of links to blogs on social media posting, um, which cover some of the things that I've talked about for anyone that wants to um, look into that a bit more. And I've also just put a link to the Facebook group um, we have called Thriving Food Hubs. Um, and there's lots of marketing resources on there as well as other. Okay, can I just interrupt you? I think you put them in a private message because they're not in the general chat. Oh, I've sent them to the waiting room. I am having, I'm being like really technically ditzy today. Sorry, everybody, <laughs> bearing with me. Wow. Um, I wanted everyone to be at the potential to see these things. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've just reposted them, but now they just look like a bunch of links all together. So sorry, it's not very like clear what each of them are. Um, but there's two blogs and then a link to the Facebook group. And there's some, there's loads of different resources on there. And you can also find the previous two sessions to this session. So even if you're not ready maybe to crowdfund now, but if you're ready to crowdfund in the future, um, then you've got a really good trio um, to refresh your memory of exactly how to go about it, which um, we hope will, will help. Um, and the final thing I'm going to put in the chat actually is a um, is a feedback form about the session and we'd be super grateful if you have time to to fill that out it really helps us to improve what we're offering um yeah so every every time anyone fills these out after a session it really really helps us to keep offering these resources and improve them um and we really appreciate it and we really appreciate you for joining us and anna thank you so much for coming um again and 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 talking to us and, and adding to this this resource um which we hope will help food enterprises now and in the future and and yeah thanks everyone for coming it's really lovely to see you all and um lovely to see our new faces and as well as thanks um to everyone that yeah also offered um really interesting things into the space your own stories and also jade for the funding opportunity that's a, a really useful share so thank you for that and i'll make sure to save it and add it to the event pages too. Um, so does anyone else have any last questions before um, we sign off for today? Yeah, I do, Kay. These resources, are they intended only for um, members of OFN or can we share them more widely? Yeah, you can share them as wide as you like. Um, we kind of have a home for them at the moment in the Thriving Food Hubs group. Um, but can we're anyone also... go there? Is that all right? You haven't got to be a food hub to um, go to It's Thriving kind of mostly relevant for food enterprises, but it is yeah. an open group. Um, so we have people, lots of people joining who are thinking about setting up a food hub. And yeah, so it's all yeah, over the room for, for food enterprises, far and wide, food producers, food hubs. Um, and also there's there are some lots of OFN specific um, resources in there as well, but it's a it's a it's a good mix. Um, yeah, so it's, it's great a good thanks, Kay. Thanks for asking. And cool. And any other questions? Awesome. So perfectly timed pause. So thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. Love to see you all and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. And next week we'll be doing a marketing specific session. So it'll be, um, yeah, uh, half Q and A um, to get your specific questions answered and then half um, for me doing a general overview of ways to improve your marketing specifically if you're a food enterprise, both a producer or a hub. Um, cool, so maybe see you next week and if not, hope to see you all soon and thanks again and have a great week. <laughs>